Welcome to the A to Z Running Podcast, where we help runners thrive. I'm Andy. And I am Zach. And up next, we discuss downtime and down cycles and ways to benefit best from either. After that, World of Running updates about the New York City Marathon and World Mountain Championships. Well, hey, let's make sure you share your questions so we can share our answers. And the best way to do that is to go to adzrunning.com slash question. At the end of the month, every month, we answer listener questions and we'll answer any of them up to the time limit that's available to us. So as many as you want to submit, feel free to do so. Mm-hmm. And many of you have been asking about discount codes and it's... Hmm. I think the great timing of this is that people are looking as the season season of giving is unfolding for some deals on stuff that runners love because many of you have friends that are runners or are family members or you're sending your list to someone else. Well, we do have codes for some things. One of the things that we have is the She's Birdie personal device we alarm. Thing off no, she- we should oh. not. <laughs> You don't want to have that blaring on the podcast? I don't want it blaring on the podcast. This is mine in the aqua color because it looked good with A to Z running. Oh, look at uh, you. But there's a lot of different colors to choose from, and it comes with this nice gold carabiner. But what it is, you're able to pull down very easily, and an alarm goes off, and it's a really loud alarm. It is very loud. Yes. And so this just gives another layer of safety to your run. And I am really glad for something that's small like this that I can have with me and bring with me into all places. It's allowed in convention halls where I work and you can travel with it. So it's uh, a great device to have for yourself or maybe for someone that you love that you want to gift this to. The code that we have is for 15% off of She's Birdie and that code is A. T-O-Z-15, A to Z-15. Excellent. Well, speaking of things you love and things that you can take with you anywhere, like this podcast, we've got (laughs) some great and interesting things to share with you today. So if you're in one of those situations where your training is turning to a new season sometime in the near future or recent past, this topic is especially pertinent. But also, what kinds of things do you want to be thinking about when you're thinking about what training looks like one season to another in general. We've got that and more up next. Okay, well, we are going to talk about some downtime. Everyone likes a little downtime Downtime. sometimes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess that's kind of the question here because it's not that these are things that we've never discussed in the past at all, um, but we want to try to compile some of the thoughts and reminders about what does it look like in between seasons, but also there's a, there's another thought here that it's not just we're not just talking about like recovery between seasons, uh, but also like does a season that's different, you know, a down cycle as Andy is calling them, um, is that something that I should do from time to time? Is that something I need right now based off of how things are going for me right now? And how do I know some of that? And then what does it look like? So we we wanted to share a little bit about that, and especially just thinking about how certain things kind of require us to make these choices and what are those certain things and how do I make sure I'm making Mm -hmm. a good choice now as far as the recovery bit we did want to mention it as part of this discussion so after a marathon distance you've done damage to your mitochondria to your muscles there are micro tears there's a need for rest so that being the case we're talking about like a couple you need, weeks. Like, biological or recovery. You yes. need the Your biological body needs to repair. recovery in addition to probably some mental recovery as well. Well, that's so a, yes. That's that's different than talking about down cycle, but we did want to mention that that is a recommendation and that would be appropriate after the marathon distance. Yeah. So assuming you don't have like something that needs to repair an injury or like, you know, those types of situations where you just, you know, you ran a really long race and your body needs to heal up all the way before you should be thinking about training too aggressively. Um, Assuming that the question is that we're trying to answer here with downtime in general is what do you need to recharge and refresh? Mm -hmm. And for some of us, that looks very differently than for others. A good quick example, though, Lydiard used to write a lot about this. because he felt like people needed a break 
for a very specific reason. And for him, it was, we need a mental break from the rigors of training regularly. And the regularity can be, you know, maybe once a year for a couple of weeks tends to be enough in his mind for most runners, but it can be I different for a lot of people. Probably it's, it'd be more for me. It would be more for you than a couple no, of weeks. No, you always like want to get right back into it. That you do sometimes i guess it depends on yeah, how i'm well, doing and i think it's exactly gonna right. be the case for most people is that depending on how the cycle was how life is mm -hmm. you know i think that after children sometimes you, you, like for me i'm like i'm exhausted i just did this training cycle with small children and now i just want to sleep all day <laughs> I'm just yes. That's well, that could be the case. But but again, we're really answering that question. What do you need to recharge and refresh? And that mental break piece um, is something that all of us probably should be doing and with some kind of regularity. Uh, again, what that is, it depends on the person. But the reason for this is because most of the time when we experience challenges implementing training, um, it has to do with the pressures of sustained you know, the burnout experience over time, the pressures of sustained aggressive structure. And so then, it, then it also becomes a question of like, do I need, does, does downtime mean no structure at all? Like a total break and for how long, but does it also mean potentially just doing things differently for a bit, mm -hmm. which is an important possible answer to the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sometimes your body needs to recover. We certainly understand that. And uh, in order to know how long, to take time downtime to recovery, we have to let the body kind of tell us. Um, so a, a good example is we suggest for marathoners, you finish a marathon and unless something's like clearly injured, um, then you try jogging again reasonably soon after that, like maybe a few days. Um, not necessarily, you're not trying to train at all, but just go out for a short jog, 10, 15 minutes, 20, 30 minutes max. Um, for the point of trying to see how your body feels. You're creating a baseline then. How am I feeling a few days after this race? I feel terrible. So I'm not going to do this again for a little while, you know, or I actually feel quite great, but I'm still not going to try to like jump right back into training right away. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm just kind of getting a sense for how I'm feeling because that's how I know, you know, how, how long should I stay relaxed with these things? Or do I need to take more days off entirely? The key thing here, and there's an idea that we're going to kind of underscore now for the, like the whole time we're talking about this topic, is this concept of goal urgency. And I'm going to call it, I'm coining the phrase, the goal urgency trap. But there's actually like, this is a well written about concept. And I just used my own words to say the same thing that is already there. But the goal urgency trap is like, I have something I need to accomplish. And so as quickly as possible, I need to be accomplishing it. But that's not how, that's not how training works or running at all. And so, you know, if I, if I need downtime, the thing that's going to help me accomplish my goal ultimately is the downtime mm -hmm. in that instance. And we as runners sometimes are so afraid to lose fitness mm -hmm. because we work so hard to achieve it or maintain it that it's difficult. As Zach said, the goal urgency trap happens because we see where we want to go and we see how far we've come and we don't want to lose anything. And you have to be able to have consistency. That is the number one thing I hear from all the pros that we talk to on our show and so many runners. And in fact, other industries and other passions that people have, people that excel at things, they talk about consistency through time. And if we're not allowing ourselves to take a break, which we don't lose a ton of fitness, by the way, <laughs> in those short amount, short amount of time, we are then able to achieve our goals even even better because we are taking that time. But I do I want to you know put that out in the open because I do think that that's a common fear, the fear of losing fitness. Yeah, and you've heard us mention in the past, um, in general, that one of the strategies that uh, like Dathan Ritzenhain, for example, uses with some of his runners is like, okay, you're going to have a break, and it's going to be for this amount of time, and then you're going to check in, and so it's like. You intentionally, you're very deliberate about, I need this break, but this break is not an indefinite thing. It's not itself going to like become the norm. It has a limit. And so I think that's an appropriate way to think about these kinds of things too, where it's like, okay, for the next four days, I'm not going to do any running, or I'm going to only jog occasionally here and there for the next three weeks. And at that exact moment in time, I'm going to check in with myself and kind of reorient toward, you know, the goals because that's, you know, that's what I need. Sometimes it's like, I'm going to give it a week 
check in and say, I need another week. And you know, it kind of just depends on how it's going. So I think, you know, when we talk so much about training based off of effort and intuitive training, that's also important in terms of like intuitive resting and being very aware of what we need in a given period, both physically and mentally. That kind of brings us to like in general, um, that the, nervous system experience and life stresses and some of those kinds of things. Um, we, we just need different things at different times. You know, if it's the same thing all the time, especially if it's like high pressure, uh, that can be, that can be bad. And so one of the questions is what does a mental break look like? Mm -hmm. Cause there's, there's a lot of ways we can take a mental break and not mean like just sitting on the couch all day. Mm -hmm. What do you think Andy? Yeah, there are a lot of ways. And for me, as Zach had touched on earlier, the unstructured time with running has been very beneficial for me. And the mental break is I do what I want to do on that day with the people I want to do it with. So I will I will run with anyone uh, at any time of day that I'm available I don't have a set routine or agenda. And you know, sometimes I'll be like, I wanna do a long run and that's that's fine. But I think having the flexibility and being able to run with whomever I would like to run with, no matter what paces you know, people are going, um, I think is really beneficial to me. And that is a break for me, yeah. not to have something on the schedule. Yeah, and for many, the break is just a different kind of activity, um, which can can be very productive for a mental break. Even though I'm not doing, I'm doing something with the time. It's just a different something, and it has a different kind of like I'm not really putting pressures on myself to perform. When I jump on the bike, for instance, an exercise bike or my bike bike, um, I don't really feel the training pressures that I do when I'm running. Are you on Zwift though? No. Um, but you did that. Well, I remember that Zwift one time you did money. that? Okay. Well, you, you got super into it. And super oh yeah. But that was itself a <laughs> mental break and this is important. Okay. So I was highly invested in the Zwift races, which was, it was so much fun. Um, but it was, but it was not a, like I wasn't training for a certain goal. I was just each time I had an opportunity to do it, I was like, how well can I do today? And I was very careful to not like destroy myself, you know, cause you can do that very easily in competitive situations. Um, but, but that was itself a very reinvigorating time. And when I went back to running training shortly after that period of Zwift stuff, I was that much more invested in running training and feeling good about that too. Cause it was, mm -hmm. you know, kind of that. So that one of the concerns that comes up all the time when we're talking about breaks with runners is that we tend to um, we tend to find that zero activity for a prolonged period of time is bad for runners in general. Um, mentally, mentally, physically. Yes. As so well, I, I talk about like the need for a mental break, but then a prolonged period of time of zero activity tends to produce dissatisfaction with myself. It tends to make me a less disciplined person in the short term. Um, it affects my general discipline and life structure. Well, it changes but you it, too because it changes how you like your hormones, how your body is processing. Yes, your fuel, circadian rhythms, your routines. Everything. Yes. So in that being the case, I have to think about, you know, if I need that, I need it. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to complain about like, I've got to take a month off. And that's just simply the fact. Um, but if that's not necessarily the thing that's helping me re refresh and reinvigorate, it can in fact be harming me too. So that's where the key of knowing what you need and how to identify that has a lot to do with is the thing I'm doing helping me. Yeah, you still want to follow health recommendations of doing exercise daily. If that's not running, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But maybe find something else to do. Go for a walk. Mm -hmm. Cycle good. like Zach is talking about. Play maybe. Wii Fit where you're like <laughs> jumping around and swinging. Some Zumba perhaps. So there's a lot of ways to stay active. And I was kidding about the Wii Fit thing, Andy. I, that doesn't count. I don't know what you do in Wii Fit. I'll be honest. <laughs> I'm really not that familiar. Okay. So. Your joke was lost on me. Sorry. Well, all right. That's fine. So, yes, uh, what, w just thinking through, okay, if I need if I need downtime, I'm really trying to answer the question, what's it going to take to refresh and reinvigorate me? And that it helps to kind of put a deadline on it. Like, I'm going to do this for this time until this point um, and just kind of see you know, how it goes. Yeah. That that's, tends to be the best way to try to approach it. Right. And so now we're going to talk about a down cycle, but 
with running? And what does it look like to have a training cycle where you're running, but maybe there are some differences to your normal training? Yeah. So if the if the question before was more like in limited, just the downtime in, in a transitionary period, now the question is, what do you need to manage life balance better? Like your your season of life needs a different balance than what you've had previously. And so what is it going to take to manage that better? Or what do you need to reinvigorate your training goals? So like I'm feeling like, do I really want to keep chasing this marathon goal? Do I really want to do another season of this thing? And if the answer is like, I feel like I don't want to do that, um, then the question is, should I do something different to reinvigorate me a bit? Um, yeah. So and maybe if you've been doing marathon cycle upon mm -hmm. marathon cycle upon marathon cycle and you're just a little tired of these back to back to back marathon cycles, maybe you'd look to train for, say, a 5K. Well, and the opposite can be true. And so it should be noted that, that when I ran my first marathon was at a time when I was feeling like I just don't really want to do this running training thing as much anymore as I used to. And... I had been basically doing like 5K, 10K focus for years and years. And a friend of mine was like, well, you just, just do a marathon then. <laughs> he literally was like, you don't want to run anymore? Do a marathon. And I'm like, that doesn't sound <laughs> like running. the thing. More running. Or, you know, in this case, longer races. Um, I can't say that I was necessarily training all that much more because I was doing a lot of training. But maybe that was part of the problem too. I was too much aggressive training. So the, the thought here is something different might be needed, but we're not talking about something different like a break for a bit. We're talking about like a different focus in training for a season. Um, and so that versus like a life balance thing, those are two different situations. So let's talk about both of them separately. Reinvigorating the training in general um, is basically just like, I need to change things up for a bit. And it's not always like, I, I don't love what I'm doing anymore, but it's like, physiologically, I just need a different stimulus for a little while because I've been doing the same thing for long enough or because I have this next big thing coming in a year and I want to do something different for a little bit so that that's kind of refreshed when it comes up, right? So in terms of doing that, um, we suggest simply trying to adjust the type of training focus. And you can do that in one of two ways. You can do different like distances. Certainly that's one way, but also like different event types. So if you're like a road runner, but you're like, you know, tinker with trails, a bit, then maybe a trail race is in fact a great way to have that slight tweak. Or if you're feeling like you're obsessed with chasing a certain goal and you just need a break from that, find a distance you haven't done before. Find something that you like cannot. Like a 9.2K? <laughs> so find something you can't compare mm -hmm. and it could alleviate some of the pressures you're feeling. And we talk about being an obligatory runner and getting to that space where you lose your joy of running. Sometimes it can be helpful to have a goal in a season that you cannot compare. Well, <laughs> a lot of people will put it into calculators and try to compare, but yeah, you I'll really can't. It will be a PR no matter what you do because it's your first time out doing that distance or that kind of event. That's and that is a good way to do it because if you take away the competitive comparison element, yeah, that's so you have the event focus in terms of like a change. You also have the training stimulus focus, and so those aren't always the same. You know, sometimes the race event you're going to do is trained for in the same way or similar way as you were doing before, but that's you know a difference that still is invigorating. And other times it's like I need to change the way I'm training for a little bit. And then from there, you think about, okay, how much time do I want to devote to this? You know, do I, am I going to do this for 20 weeks for like half a year season? Or uh, do I just want to do something different for like five or six weeks, a little micro cycle? And both are legitimate options. In fact, we often find that when you're coming off a big race season and you've got a lot about, you've got a lot of time, like you don't have an immediate race goal coming up, but you have just like this downtime in between that you don't want to be downtime from training it's just there's not something that's immediately pressing then that's a great time to do like six weeks of a very different kind of training stimulus and as a consequence you get some physiological benefits of that change but you also just get to have a kind of fun that you don't normally have so zach i'd love for you to tell our audience about how you did that this well that's exactly summer. what i plan to do so oh, okay. not because you should do what i do although you know if it this works is fun to hear about uh, i think like an yes. example so this is something we advise with our runners too, and it came from uh, my coach Barry originally uh, when he was advising me to do some things differently as I had these kind of short stints of time between season focuses. And so what he said was, well, okay, you're going to do a marathon again next, so let's just do like short, fast stuff for a little bit just for some fun. 
And he literally said, like, this is just going to be fun. Four weeks of fun. And here's what it was. You tell me if this sounds like four weeks of fun. We're doing, like, uh, like 200-meter repeats, basically. Um, we're doing short time trial, like, really hard two-mile efforts, like, near all out two-mile efforts. We're doing hill sprints, which I haven't done since I was, like, 20 years old or, or younger even. So we're doing hill sprints and then we're doing other like longer, hard, fast stuff. And he's like, jump in as many races as you can in these weekends of like 5k or 10k. And so it it was basically like a lot of really short intensity, which is something that I'm entirely unfamiliar with as I'm doing a lot of marathon work currently. So that being a very, very different training stimulus for four to six weeks, throwing in elements like the hill work type of stuff. Sometimes we've even thrown in like like plyometric types of bounding springing types of exercises as a workout, you know, doing that on a hill. Um, I would not advise that you do that if you are older than 30, you know, basically that's a young person's thing, a young person's game for the most part. Otherwise we tend to see lots of injuries, but so thing like other types of hill stuff, those good. So the point there was we're going to do that for four weeks. That's not because there's some like big, huge goal. Um, but because it just is something different for a bit and gives you a kind of a totally different training experience for a while. And then we really didn't like the volume was nowhere near what it normally is. I, I would run like two hour long run instead of two and a half or three hour long runs. Um, and, and the, even that sometimes it wasn't even two hours, it was just a little bit shorter because that just wasn't the, that wasn't the important thing for a bit. Um, but it was a very short period of time because the big goals were still oriented around the next marathon cycle. But tell them the benefit. Like what, well, did, what did we see as the result? Of so it, was, it was great. It was running yeah. very, very fast compared. I mean, I was running basically as fast as I had in when college. I was 20 years old. So in college, uh, faster he, actually than when I was yeah. 20 years old. Um, that's not, again, th- we're not using this illustration to suggest you're going to go out and run your mile PR or 5k PR when you're, you know, 10 years past that PR, but it's possible. It's possible. <laughs> and part of the reason why it's possible is because if you are training well, if you're training at an excellent caliber, um, sustained over time, what we tend to notice is that the things that we're, when we do something different, it doesn't take much of a different kind of stimulus to maximize the benefits of that different kind of stimulus with every exception, except for the longer end. So it, it takes longer than a four week stint to suddenly best my marathon PR most of the time. Um, but you know, short of that, there's a lot of things possible here. And so we've, we've done this with runners many times where it's like, okay, I've got 20 weeks here that's available to me, but I only really need 15 weeks to do the training cycle we're planning for the next big goal. So what am I going to do with those five weeks in between? Well, I could just kind of be casual and unstructured, but that's not something I need right now. I don't need downtime. I just want something a little different for a bit. So try something a little different. Mm -hmm. That's one example. However, there's another long version that's like, you know, I want a whole season. That's something different too. Um, and that's where we look at, you know, what am I going to train for in that season? Is it the same thing and I'm just going to train differently or am I going to train for a different kind of event? And then what should I do in training to prepare myself differently for that event? There's And there's, of course, the sky's the limit there. You can do anything you want with that kind of stuff. But the, the point is I want to reinvigorate my focus on my big goals if, in fact, that's what I'm thinking about here. And so then I want to do the kind of training that is going to still help me move forward toward those goals but just in a different way. Mm-hmm. And we can't, I mean, we can, we can give you lots of examples. Yeah. There's so many um, different ways. Lots and lots of done. different possible yeah. examples, but really what it comes down to is um, whatever you're doing currently, what's an adjustment to that, that helps accomplish that goal. So if you want to write in to our podcast and ask your question specifically, go to a to slash question and share it. And then we'll answer more directly what that could look like for you. We'd be glad to do so. Um, But I will mention this, and this is the part I was going to say earlier. So we have that goal urgency trap that I am trying to coin the phrase, and I'm pretty confident that no one else has used it on a large-scale published version. But anyway, the point is is that goal urgency trap applies to these kinds of things where it's like, well, I just have to do the same thing over and over, season upon season, because I have this big goal, and I don't want to do something that takes away from that, and I lose time. And the answer here is a lot of times these reinvigoration seasons – are moving us forward toward our goals better than just another of that same old thing, depending on, you know, what it is and what we need. So that's where that, you know, I fall into that trap of thinking again, where I do things I don't, that don't really sound interesting to me. And I just feel like I want to do something different, but I don't out of an obligatory sense Mm. of urgency for my goals. Mm -hmm. 
you never want to sign up for a race that you're dreading. Oh yeah, that's so bad. That is so bad. Thanks for saying that because I do that a lot. Um, and it's like uh, I don't really want to do that race, but I kind of feel like I just should, <laughs> and that's not good. <laughs> maybe I'll maybe I'm doing it because I know I'll enjoy it later. Like I'm looking forward to it eventually, and just not at the moment. That's one thing. But I even think it's then, tough to do. And yeah. we've had this discussion with some of our athletes. Okay, they're deciding you know which race to do, and that could be different race distances too. Which one? excites you more Mm. that's the one you should do because what is this all about anyway (laughs) right Right. it's about enjoying the experience it's about life in motion which is what a lot of us runners truly truly hold on to when it comes to being lifelong runners like the experiences right so choose the goal that sounds the most fun to you even if it maybe is a little scary you know like oh i'm gonna do a mile when i haven't run a mile in such a long time well it excites me and maybe i'm a little scared but at the same time that's gonna really motivate me and to get me going and also again the comparison thing like how am i gonna compare when i haven't done this in a decade or or five years Mm -hmm. or what have you but there's just there's so many ways that we can breathe life and newness and it can and and maybe that isn't what (laughs) Is exciting to you. Maybe you really like to do the same thing. And there's a routine and comfort in that. So I don't know what's right for you, but these are just ideas. Yeah. And the so the idea behind that that urgency obligation sense, um, just kind of considering the concept here, and this is this is really fascinating. So it was like uh this is a long standing concept. Uh I think Covey's book, the highly effective habits book, um, kind of repopularized it, but it's been around forever. And um, with lots of different names, but so the name we'll we'll give it here in this example is the Eisenhower Matrix. Sometimes it's it called mm-hmm. Eisenhower stuff. But sometimes it's his name's not in it at all. But the, part of the reason why he's attached to it is because um, he wrote about this post presidency about like here's how I was able to be effective in things, and so you know people kind of gravitated toward that. Uh, but what it is, so the the word they use is mere urgency effect, and the mere urgency effect is by definition, our attention drawn to time-sensitive tasks over tasks that are less urgent, even when the less urgent tasks offer greater rewards. So that's where the thought of like, this sounds way more fun. You know, the rewards are much higher for me, but I'm going to do the other thing because I feel like I have to, because Mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's the thing that I need to get to my goal, or at least that's what I'm thinking. But what they find, and this is the key piece I wanted to reflect on with you all right now, they find that the, the most of the time, people make that choice, the more urgent sense choice over the more goals, uh, rewards choice, because they are under stress and feeling time crunch, busyness types of things. So what it, what it produces in us is, is if we are in a more stressed state, if we're in a more like feeling the, the obligatory urgent kind of state, we tend to make those choices when the thing we need to help get us out of that stress is the thing where it's harder to choose because of our stress. So the point here is it's good to sometimes make the choice of like, that doesn't feel like it's going to move me toward my goal, but maybe that's a good thing because it helps take me out of this urgent thinking, which is good. Mm. The Eisenhower matrix is the thing of like set up for yourself. The, you know, here's the things that I'm, that I'm going to do and have to do. Here's the things that I can schedule and do at a certain time at a different time. Here are the things that I can delegate to someone else. And here's the stuff that I can just get rid of, delete it. Um, that's what the Eisenhower matrix is. Those you categorize tasks in those four ways that doesn't necessarily apply to training as directly, but the rationale for it makes a lot of sense there. Mm -hmm. They basically say the intervention that seems to make a difference. If you take a bunch of people who are highly stressed and they're making these bad choices about their time sensitive tasks. Um, if you tell those people in the moment, uh, if you choose this, then it will be, it'll give you these rewards. If you choose this, it will give you these rewards. What will you choose then? And simply attaching the sense of what's the value of the thing makes all the difference. So in your training, that's what you need to do is you need to look at here are my choices and which one has the rewards that I most want the rewards that are most valuable to me. And then I use that to drive my desire for the thing, as opposed to like, this just sounds better in the moment. And I also think, though, it's very important to think of it holistically, though, because I think that I would answer differently depending on what my focus was. Mm. If it was performance, 
there would be one thing I'd choose. But if it is the overall experience that I've been expressing to you all and wanting to be a lifelong runner and experience, those goals sometimes can be held at tension. But to know that if I'm having consistency, if I'm finding joy in running in the sport, I am going to get to that performance goal too because it's consistency over time. So it is kind of confusing, I guess, as we digest this all together. But I do think it's important to think of the holistic version of those rewards that we want to see coming to fruition through the sport of running. Speaking of holistic, that's our final note here, which is the life balance side of things. So the need for down cycles often for many of us is attached to the need for a change in my my schedules because my life is right. out of balance because I need I have new stressors. Moving, <laughs> a baby. Yes, right. <laughs> uh, babies. Yeah, we've, we've, uh, we've heard that plenty from runners. Whether you're having a baby or your spouse is having a baby, you've got uh, a situation and it requires an adjustment. So- Here's the first thing that we always have to think about is what needs to change for it to feel manageable? That's the first question you have to answer. Um, is it too many days and I need to cha- take days off that you know I haven't been? Is it too much time in a given day? And I can do this every day, but I don't have as much time available. Or is it more things like I can't handle the structure and it needs to be kind of more loose or mm-hmm. I can't handle the intensity and it needs to have less pressure? So those are kind of the four main ways we, we look at something like that. And if it's if it's something like too many days, you know, these are easy solutions where it's like, I really can't run every single day of the week in the weekdays. I can run three of them. And so I, you know, I take the, the days that I need to take off during the week and then I do what, you know, what I have time on the weekend so I can go ahead and run those days. And it's not a question of like, is that going to take away from my training goals? Because if that's what I have to do, it doesn't matter if it's going to take away from my training goals. That's what I have to do for my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't always have to be. This is the part of like the structure side. It doesn't have to be the same every week either. So I might say to myself, I have these three days that I may take off each week. But if I don't need to, I'll do X instead. Mm-hmm. And so I have kind of like a it, it may or may not be this thing, but I still have a baseline mm-hmm. structure. And we've actually written in for athletes because it's been helpful, this or this, this or this, mm-hmm. so that there is an option and there's not defeat. So I can't do this thing that's written on the schedule, therefore I'm not going to do that and it's stressing me out. I feel but like I'm have falling short. Or I'm I feel like, it, yeah, yeah no. just not feeling great about it. But to have an option that's different or takes less time or, you know, there's there's lots of variation to this. But then you can see that and you can see the choice and you can make the right choice for the day. Mm-hmm. And then know that you're still moving towards uh, your goal and, and progressing. So yep. I think that it. That's also a really great thing for those of us who like structure, but we also have lives that require us to be flexible. Yeah. And that's so, you know, what we tend to do there is um, start with what are the training priorities? So I, I have five days. I can do five days of training in a given week. Um, and so, but but at the same time, it may not necessarily be true every single week and I might need more flexibility there. I might shuffle some things around. So we might sit down with an athlete and say, here are the top three training priorities every week. Those are the three things you need to do. And so if I can't do other things, everything else is subject to the chopping block. But those three I'm going to find a way to do in any given week. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, things like that. And and I will say, by the way, three is, in fact, the baseline number. So if with it, with any runner, if I'm saying I, I want to progress in my training to whatever degree is possible, um, but I need to make, cut some things back, we start with that three. These are the three things that we should try to do every week. And any running I can do beyond that is helping. So the first, you know, the three are exactly what you'd expect. It's your long run, your second long run, which I guess maybe people don't necessarily expect me to say that. And then some kind of strong effort, which is either a sustained strong effort or a fart like type of thing that's highly neuromuscular. And you can flex that. It can be either um, depending on, you know, what sounds good in, on the day. So this the first long run and the second long run, the reason why those are the top two priorities is because what we find as people get busy, the thing that they need to cut the most tends to not be amount of time that I'm out doing training because I can always find a day or two in a week where I can do some longer training, but I can't do as many days with that or I have to have everything else be very short. 
you know, so I might still be able to do stuff every day, but I don't have a lot of time. I can only do that once or twice a week. Mm -hmm. So that's where we start with. Go back to the research that uh, the Japanese group did on, um, if you recall, we were sharing this in the podcast recently, on uh, marathon prediction uh, in terms of training. And what they found was there was no measurable difference between how a runner implemented their training volume in a given week um, as long as they still maintained or it sustained that volume. So one runner doing 100 miles in a week and another runner doing 100 miles a week and doing it in higher quantities all at once or lower quantities spread more evenly, and they found the results were very similar. So that tells us that if I can still get in a couple of longer efforts and I have to cut some other days out, that's still going to be profitable for me. Mm -hmm. So we take, you know, prioritize. And that's why we have this podcast and we don't have secrets about training because we think that you're going to thrive if you understand why we do these things. If we throw out ideas for how to manage and thrive in a busy life and do training at the same time. So that's why we have this podcast because we want to see you understand how to how this training thing works and we have loved having our athletes really come into the like i said the driver's seat of the experience and we're guides we're guides to make that happen and so um i just want to thank you for listening and also give you kudos for being a student of the sport kudos for listening to our kudos. great podcast which is super <laughs> no, informative that's that's not what i say I did i sound like that? no but I, that's okay. what i that's what i say mm. right Okay. Well, anyway, so we do, uh, we do think that these are things that can help in terms of trying to make sure that as a runner season to season and period of time to period of time that I'm doing the thing that helps me thrive in that time and in approaching my big goals. And I think you can accomplish both things at once. That's mm -hmm. the big takeaway. Mm -hmm. So with that thought, let's, let's talk about some exciting things in the world of running. Very exciting A to Z runner updates for you here. We had a lot of people racing recently and uh, some great performances all around. It was good stuff. So congrats to the runners racing and the half marathon recently. Laura and Sam both competed. And in the full marathon, Haley, Zach, Craig, Jackson, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Nice work to all. And some special shout outs to some personal best efforts on some difficult conditions. If yeah. you recall, if anyone raced anywhere in like the upper northeast quarter of the United States, plus <laughs> some um, in the in the early November weekend here, uh, it was like crazy windy it and was. not terribly cool. It was, it was, it was fairly warm. warm. Mm -hmm. um, those are not great long distance race conditions. <laughs> no, especially because it was windy the second half. Yeah, like, for uh, depending rough, on which cruel. which course you were on too. Yeah. Get, yeah. So that being the case, um, congrats uh, to everyone who performed in those conditions and ran strong. But also we had uh, some personal best efforts. Yeah. So congrats to Jax and Stephanie for knocking Big out some PRs. marathon PRs. Minutes on awesome. minutes. That's fantastic. Impressive. Awesome. Nice Congratulations. Well, speaking of marathons, the NYC Marathon had some interesting drama, drama. which we it's fun to see the sport play out this way where Drama's we fun. don't know who's going to win or we think someone's going to win and they don't. There's a, or just I things mean, don't that's, happen the way. Exactly. So rough way. conditions, as we said, Helen O'Beary was headlining the New York City Marathon in her debut in her debut because she's an excellent runner and we didn't know how Helen O'Beary would handle a marathon. So she ran well, she went for the win and she ended up sixth. Okay. That's which not is bad. Still a great, <laughs> it's a great debut. Yeah. She ended up running 225 49 for her debut and she was in the lead pack. In fact, she was leading a lot of the race until just before central park, which was around mile 23. Mm. So yeah, she had a strong race, but the headliner post race was a debut for the win in an upset. Sharon Lockady, like Lockady, Lockady, <laughs> in a time of two twenty three twenty three. Mm. 
And Let's Run is calling it one of the biggest upsets in NYC marathon history. Why are they calling it one of the biggest upsets? Because she she beat all the the telltale. Yeah, yeah I mean, like the world champion exactly. was in the race, and she yeah. beat her. So and yeah, and yeah. Sharon was the 2018 NCAA 10K champion for Kansas, but mm. there's not a ton of accolades accolades and um, that's, that's a big no, accolade true. i mean to win ncaa but yeah but not in the long not roads long, like you know? not you know half marathon mar- you know 25k there's not a lot to look at when it comes to long distance so that's cool i love it i love the upsets fun. it's fun it's good for the American side of the race, we had a strong showing with Alephine Tulemach leading the way, and she ran 226.18 for seventh place. Emma Bates, who's been on the podcast before, and uh, she ran 226.53 for eighth place. She has been so consistently good mm. at the marathon. And I, I was know what you're going to say. Raving to Zach the other day because. <laughs> On our episode with her, which I'll link to, she discussed how she really does go by the feedback that she's getting internally. She gets into a flow state and she lis- like she listens to her intuition. She's got amazing In other words. instincts. <laughs> yeah, she, she she races by effort. But she runs within herself, and it's just amazing to see how relaxed and calm she will be through all the stages of the race. But then showing up and performing this way yet again on a difficult course is just uh, a testament how to her abilities as a runner to be consistent no matter what. So Emma Bates for eighth place. And then Nell Rojas, she ran to uh, 28.32 for 10th place. Solid. Yeah. And then there's some more strong finishes for American women. Lindsay Flanagan, previous podcast guest, ran 229.28. And uh, let's see. Stephanie Bruce, she ran 230.34, which this is her final marathon. And she was 13th place. And then former American record holder and previous podcast guest, Kira D'Amato, ran 223.31. And this has been her third marathon since July. She's so running a lot of marathons. She's been, and not just a lot of marathons. She's been running a lot of those championship yes, road well, races, Yes, well, it's because too. it's because after setting that American record, she's making tons of entry right. fee dollars. So she's going to... Not entry fee, but... Uh, yes. N- no, it's appearance a... Fee. Appearance fee. Yeah, yep. appearance fee. Not I mean, it's, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Same, same difference. <laughs> yeah, now, Andy's reading everyone's times here, but you should remember that New York was super slow this year. Like times way yeah. slower than they normally are for these for these front. Yeah, runners. these are usually like low to twenty three, twenty two, two twenty two. Yeah, I mean we're women. talking about like five to ten minutes faster normally mm-hmm. for uh, these types of things. So that, that that should be noted because you know these are impressive performances, but uh, you know this is impressive performances on what is more impressive, knowing that it was an especially challenging day. Yeah, yeah. So Akira was fifteenth place, by the way. So they were all. Really, I mean, I just listed a lot of American women that were in the top fifteen. So, so on the men's Excited. side, the the lead aspects of the race were fascinating, and this is something that I just I'm always I, I almost want to like be with the color commentators and like having a conversation about it because I just really want to like hear more thoughts <laughs> and then because you know you never know what to say. So here's what happened: uh, Daniel Do Nascimento of Brazil um, took off. Like guns a blazing for what amounted to world record pace for the first like 10k. Um, and we're talking about like he ran his second 5k was like 14 11, and he's never run this fast before. So the question becomes, what is this guy doing? And this is where like I just love to have the conversation because the race commentators, you know, they're basically kind of like doing the uh, well, he's going out pretty fast, but maybe he can hold. Maybe not. We'll see. I thought it was interesting. I don't want to be critical because I don't know exactly all the information they had, but they were saying like the other guy shouldn't have let him go. Yeah, they were saying that for a while. Like yeah, they're kind of taking I'm... a risk here, letting him go. And I'm like, no, no. they're not. Yeah, they're not. he's he can't do it. He can't do it. And I'm not saying that he couldn't. That, you know, this guy's a great yeah. marathon. And he might Olympic eventually marathon put it together. All yeah, sure. But the point is, is when Elliot Kipchoge runs 201 and change in Berlin in 50 degrees in perfect conditions and he's going out at that pace in 70 degrees on the New York Marathon course which is not a no known fast course um then of course the answer is no he can't do that it it, it i mean statistically it's 
entirely unlikely that he can do that. Um, but the question is, what happens? Because mm. what happens can be there's a lot of different things. He can yeah. fade, but doesn't mean he like dies or he just fades a bit. You know all that kind of stuff. So the the racers behind him made the calculated decision that he was going to die. That he was just going to completely can it at some point in the race because they didn't even try to keep they up with him. They ran with a separate race yeah, in the chase pack. They did. And that was, of course, the, that was the right move because it is a hot day. It is a hilly course, um, challenging course. And so here's how it went down. All right. So he's leading uh, by minutes and minutes. At halfway, he's two minutes and 12 seconds ahead of the field. At 18 miles, he's still a minute and what was it, like a minute and 40 seconds or something. And so at 18 miles, he's still got a ton of time on them. But let's always remember what Barry McGee says. And uh, Arthur Lydiard said before him that the marathon doesn't start. The race does not start until mile 20. And it does not matter what things are happening at mile 18. It matters what is happening at mile 20. Um, and so these guys, you know, a couple of minutes behind and with 10K to go plus, no problem. That's catchable distance for any level of marathoning unless that guy is so much better than everyone else that he can finish just as strong as them with going out that fast. So things started to fall yeah. apart and it's sad to see and so i feel bad like reporting not, on this but no 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 we're this not this is what happened you we're, know? we're not it's making light of no. his challenges we're no. saying this is just what happened in the race and right. now the next question is you know what what was he thinking as he's doing these things right so he he starts to fade around mile 18 in fact at that time he, he like took a bathroom stop which yep. doesn't ever happen hardly ever at this level and so then you know clearly you know something's not right for to right. take a pit it was stop. only like 18 seconds Very but quick. it's still he was already starting to to make that fade and and then by mile 20 he was doing some walking uh, yeah. on the side like like clearly a deliberate he stopped and walked for a little bit and then like they they said he uh, and Moved you look at the video clip and... he did something with his arms that like he's clearly trying to just like get himself, get himself kind of back into a comfortable rhythm so and then mile 21 he starts wavering a touch and then like just drops face down Cla on the ground. He didn't classes. like he didn't pass out, so he didn't like go unconscious and hit no. the ground. He but he he just kind of like collapsed uh, to the ground. Yep. And so then you know was, he just he he had everything was gone. He had spent mm -hmm. everything he had, and there was still five miles left in the race, and mm -hmm. that's that. So then Evans Chibet of Kenya came on, and he was coming on strong for a few miles at right, that point right. already. Been catching. Yep. And so he went by him shortly after that. He was he, You could see him in the video clip. He's not far behind him when the collapse happened at mile 21. Right. So he passes him there and goes on to win the race in a very strong final 10K, which is hard to do with those conditions. And, uh, you know, just it raised that question of was that, was that, you know, a calculated choice or was it just kind of like a, a bad instinct in the time, you know, in the mm -hmm. moment? Who knows? Well, he did for the Olympic marathon also went out really hard, but he's 24 yes. years old and he is a very fast runner. So I think he just wants these things to come together for him. Well, and, yeah. and it's possible that eventually it will, but it seems it, from what his agent said that he's kind of, you know, he's young and he's excited. And so he, he just went out just way an, too an, an hard. Experienced for, decision. Yeah. yeah. An experienced decision. He went out too hard and a difficult course on a difficult day. So that yeah. is the truth. We did have uh, the top American finisher was ninth. That was Scotty Fobble in uh, a, a strong time, but, you know, several minutes slower than he's run. And so that's just indicative of, you know, kind of how does this compare to some other good performances by these people. Um, it should be noted that Galen Rupp was in the race. He, this is the second time now that he's uh, struggled in a, in a recent major race, and he ended up dropping out as well. So there's a lot of questions circulating is Galen Rupp kind of done at this point with, you know, with being able to put together the highest level of races. Cause he has expressed, he's got like a back problem among yeah. some other issues. And so as soon as you start talking about things like that, that can be, um, that can be career ending we'll potentially. We'll see. So we'll see. World mountain championships. Thrilling. What an incredible event. So this is one that's like, it's like a multi-day it, they've got a ton of things going on and it's like the hardest way to race. It's just, I this would, is crazy I stuff. I would say so. Yeah. It was yeah. located this year in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Thailand. And yeah. it, like Zach said, it's over four days and athletes compete at vertical uphill mountain races, short and long trail races. And there's uh, classic mountain races for both seniors and U20. And I want to start with a big congratulations 
to Allie McLaughlin, who won the uphill mountain race representing the USA. Won a mountain race for yes. USA. That does not happen very often. It's not very often that it happens. Yeah. Well, it actually did happen. Uh, Grayson ran and That's right. won. Um, what, was it last year? Or was, was that it? a mountain or it was, was that a mountain. trail? That was mountain. But well, it, was, it was part of this event. It was part of this event. Yep. Okay, nice. Yeah, so uh, she won over six-time world championship Andrea Meyer of Aus- Austria and five-time European champion Maud Mathis of Switzerland. So she was beating the best in the business, and so that's very Yeah, when exciting. it comes to mountain running, beating the Europeans is hard to do. Yeah, yep. That's the truth. So, And then th- this is also a team event for you know the countries because the world championship so ali led the women's uphill usa team to victory all right exciting fun fact about this specific discipline of the world mountain championships the women's race was truly fitting for a world championship with 11 nations in the first 11 positions like different Whoa. nations so no repeat yeah. country for, 11 for the, on spots. the women's side for yeah. that for that event wow. so that was interesting and then Eclectic. italy won on the men's side in the team competition individual on the men's side was patrick uh kip uh, Kippen Gidden, oh, who <laughs> became the first Kenyan man to win a mountain running world championship. So that's I always that was been an interesting, interesting one. News. Yeah. Why do the Kenyans not traditionally, you know, win these things when, you know, they're, they live in elevation. If they live in Kenya and most parts of Kenya are at varying degrees of higher elevation. Yeah. They certainly have access to mountains uh, with Great Rift Valley types of things. And so there's always been a kind of a question there. And I think what it came down to is it's just not uh, opportunity is not high. And so as we see more, uh, you know, more eclectic involvement in the mountain stuff, which has really been mostly European for all these years, as we see more eclectic Well, the Ugandans do, I'll tell you Case about that point. later, but uh, <laughs> they, they rock it. So a couple of other highlights. Adam Peterman continued his winning streak by winning the men's long trail competition in he has never lost an ultra marathon. Hmm. He is on a winning streak. Yeah. That's crazy. Never lost or hasn't lost in a period of time. It's never an right? ultra an, an ultra, an ultra yeah. marathon period or exclamation point, whichever, <laughs> whatever <laughs> He's never suits lost. your emotion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And his gold led team USA to a victory for the men's side in the long trail competition. And the women in that event took fourth, which included previous podcast guest Brittany Char- uh, Charbonneau. So, all right, all mm-hmm, right, yeah. And then the uphill, up and downhill competition was completely swept by Uganda for men, women, and, and youth competitions. Yep, swept by which, the Ugandans. Which is, by the way, is just a theme right now where Ugandan runners have been taking on serious involvement in the highest levels of the sport in every aspect: cross country, roads, mm. track mountain you know trail running now too it's so that's interesting why you know I, I don't have an answer to you there except for that you know it's something to watch you know see yeah. the, the prominent rise of ugandan success in running is really cool mm-hmm. awesome well that's it for the world of running this week thanks so much for listening to the show if you would we would love it for you to rate and subscribe maybe share with a friend who wants to learn more about running too Thinking of things, speaking of things, we would love from you questions yes, so that uh, we can, you know, interact with you more, which is just the thing that we love to do the most. And so that we can share your questions on air to be able to extend the practicality of the things we're trying to talk about. Because, of course, as these things go, they happen most directly within the context of your training moment. And so share with us that moment, what's going on and what's the question on your mind. And it can be running, training, racing, nutrition related to running, training, racing. It can be strength and mobility. It can be, you know, anything that we try to address as a running podcast. And we would love to share some thoughts, answer your questions. Go to adzrunning.com slash question to submit anytime, any amount, and we will put them on air. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll talk to you next week. 